thank you for joining us today. I would like to start off by thanking CalCPA for graciously hosting us here and live on our webcast. The dynamics of risk in today's business environment are changing faster than ever before. Boards and executives are under extreme pressure to manage risk and make smart decisions for their companies. At the same time, the insurance industry is responding to new risk by offering new products, limiting coverage on legacy products, and scrambling to meet the demands of modern business. It is essential that boards know the right questions to ask to allow for high degrees of confidence in their decision making. Equally important is the strategic process for evaluating insurance options as well as clearly understanding self-insured risk. Our experience panel will speak to real-world examples, current trends, and practical guidance to these important issues. For those of you in the room, feel free to ask questions along the way. For those of you online, our moderator will be fielding questions throughout the session. And now, I'd like to hand it off to our moderator, Joe Talmadge, who will introduce our other panelists. Joe? Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, NACD, for having us here. I'm Joe Talmadge with Heffernan Insurance Brokers. We are one of the largest independent brokerages in California. I am joined by Soroya Wright. She's the Chief Risk Officer for SMW Risk Management Consulting. And she's also an advisory board member for RIMS. As well as Mary McCutcheon, she's an insurance coverage partner at Ferrella Braun and Martel. Uh, I've worked with both of these women in various capacities, and I think you'll be quite pleased with their experience and commentary in and around insurable risk and non-insurable risk. If you'd like additional information on their background, you can find it at the event page for this event online. So why exactly is this an important topic? As Dennis mentioned, there continues to be current events that leave executives and boards with more questions than answers in the event of a claim. The recent PG&E power outages left many companies and executives wondering or receiving a letter from an insurance company that said an explanation on voluntary versus involuntary power outages and what that meant for their coverage, whether or not it was on-site or off-site and whether that mattered, whether or not workers' wages were covered or lost income was covered as a result of the voluntary power outage. Even in seemingly straightforward claims like the 2018 Napa wildfires, you have valuation issues, you also have consequential issues like the smoke that impacted people's ability to work and product that wasn't necessarily damaged in the way that you thought it should have been damaged, but was just smelled like smoke. What happens in those circumstances? So in these circumstances, you never want to have questions, you wanna have clarity. And what, your pan what our panelists will be talking about today I'm going to talk about how to address non-insurable and insurable risk covered by Soraya, and then some of the best practices for reviewing what exactly is covered and what are the best practices for managing the claims process, not only before, during, and after uh, the claims happen. So to get things going, I'm going to hand it off to Soraya to talk about what exactly enterprise risk management is. So good morning, everyone, and thanks again for allowing, uh, inviting me here. <laughs> Um, all of us are risk managers um, in every aspect of our business. Enterprise risk management is an, a, a strategic approach towards managing a co company's risk, a portfolio of risk, so to speak. Many organizations may manage risk in silos where you know, there are operational risk, financial risk, strategic risk. But the beauty of enterprise risk management enables an organization to prioritize where to allocate resources. So it is taking that portfolio approach, understanding what key company risks are across the entire enterprise or organization, across all types of, of risk. And um, 
with systemic processes to identify, assess, and manage risk. So are there off-the-shelf approaches to, uh, to managing this? So I like to say yes and no. I mean, there are frameworks. You hear about COSO, the COSO framework or ISO framework. But I believe that the best thing for an organization is to custom design something that fits the culture and fits the organization. Every organization has its own way of making decisions. Understand, you know, what their risk tolerance is, what the appetite for risk um, is, and how they want to manage their approach towards um, accepting uh, risk. So I, I say, you know, it's, it's best to under, it's good to understand the various frameworks from a technical standpoint, to understand how to apply those to, um, to build capabilities and, and build experience uh, that will enable the organizations you're a part of or the organizations you represent and therefore uh, manage risk. But the, the main question is to understand and ask questions about, you know, how are risk ma managed and what approach are organizations taken. That's super helpful. Um, so can you comment on some of the things that need to be in place to execute on effective ERM? Yeah, so um, I would say the best practice is, one, you want to have a governance structure. You know, who owns risk? for an organization. And at the board level, it could be the entire board that, that uh, has oversight, or it could be a risk oversight committee. And then there's at the C-suite level who would champion it. You know, So this governance structure will include the board, the C-suite, and then I would say a, a risk practitioner. Sometimes it's the chief risk officer. Sometimes it's a risk manager or um, whatever the, um, the discipline is, but someone who's going to set the policy, set the, sta uh, the strategy, and, and have oversight of the, um, the, the process and the, and the framework. And then I would say each key risk should have an executive owner um, so that to ensure that risks are being managed to an acceptable level. And the first part of it is identifying what are all the, the key risks, you know, and how does something make the threshold of being um, a designated a key risk. And then um, uh, subject matter experts who will, one, manage on a day-to-day -day basis and help assess uh, risk. So the governance structure, and I would say um, systemic processes where there's constant evaluating, assessing, identifying, because things are changing all the time. You know, business strategies are, are changing, you know, uh, they're new, new innovation, your business partners, and so when you hear about things in the news, you, you, the first thing you want to know is how, how does this impact us? What are we doing? You know, are we facing similar cha challenges? So uh, systemic processes and, and communication um, strategies to um, enable information, the inflows and outflows of information um, to share about risk. And then a common language um, that will enable organizations to calibrate risk. And when I mean common language, how are risk assessed? You're using a common la language to assess that will enable uh, organizations to prioritize. Um, many of you represent companies. How many of you know the top 10 risk of your, the organizations you represent? Yeah. So a few of you. It's important. It's an important question to ask. And then it's like, okay, and how does that fit with the company's risk appetite and, and tolerance? So having um, a framework, um, the governance, and a common language, and, and, and then cascading it uh, throughout the organization. And one more point about the governance is, if you notice, it's top down and bottoms up. It involves every layer of the organization. Because that's you know the best way to, to gain insights about organ you know information. Leaders will have more of a strategic view, and you know your frontline managers will know the day to day and operational. So, Sura, you you commented about prioritizing risk and having a common language. Um, I know just from knowing you that you built the ERM program at Clorox, and I think you have a lot of valuable commentary in and around what that looked like in basically building it from scratch and, uh, and launching it. 
Can you comment about some of your experiences on how you leveraged ERM in the decision-making process and what prioritization looked like for you and <laughs> how you made smart decision-making in that process? Sure. So while I cannot talk about a specific company, I can talk about some of the, the issues or uh, give you some high-level trends. You know, I've had clients that um, decided to um, develop a marketing campaign and um, I mean, we've seen examples of, of, of marketing campaigns that have gone sour because of, you know, maybe some offensive messaging. And so we worked with a client that um, developed some strategies that uh, prevented or reduced the potential for that to happen. Um, organizations leverage it when they're determining, oh, if they're going to introduce a new product. You know, they may, or a new way of working, or moving to a new site. You know, so you hear about large companies. Um, I think Amazon was planning to move back east someplace, and then things change. You know, why did it change? You know, what happened? I don't know. They're not my clients, so I can't say I, I, I know. But it does make you, you know, to, to make an announcement, such a great, a large announcement, and then make some changes. So um, you can leverage risk management in essentially everything you do and should because um, you don't want to, the thing you want to avoid is learning about a risk after decisions have been made. You know, I know we're going to talk about smart um, uh, risk taking, but there are a lot of, um, you know, decisions and things happen, and almost everything that you hear and or read in the paper, where you know earnings have been unfavorably impacted or imp uh, operations disrupted, um, if you think about or think about those issues, um, you know what could have been done to reduce the potential. You know, what are some mitigation strategies that you can think of? Oh, you know, and hindsight's always accurate, right? So you want to get ahead of that. Um, to avoid those aha uh -huh, or oh you know what type of moments, and um, and so this discipline of of managing risk and leveraging risk, you know processes can help uh, reduce the potential you know for those things to occur. On the other hand, y you take risk to grow, right? And so how do you do that and uh, exploit? Um, opportunity risk because that's a big deal and it is about changing the dialogue from oh risk management is all about all the wrong things or the bad things can happen there's a lot of good things that should happen and and a risk in itself is if, is if you don't take risk so uh, in almost every I would say every aspect of a business there are risks and opportunities and so that's why you, you would leverage this to, to help make those uh, decisions around the choice. So you talked a lot about growth um, and, and having opportunities by using risk. Um, that, that seems to be a common theme in the Bay Area with lots of companies growing pretty fast. I mean, we've had clients that have doubled in size, you know, from 1,000 to 2,000 over 18 months, or, you know, you could be a 5,000 employee company and you want to go to 10,000 in two years and whatever the metrics are in and around growth, you want to enter a particular territory. Um, at the same time, you have this dynamic of uh, finance executives who are trying to keep costs in check uh, in and around insurance and not wanting to overinsure. Um, can you comment uh, not only about the insurance, but the non-insurable items in and around how you deal with the corporate governance issues uh, on risk? as it relates to a company that is in the middle of, of scaling up and they're trying to manage resources and and make those decisions on on growing fast uh, while paying attention to risk. Mm -hmm. Sure, that, well that's a mouthful. I mean, we can go all day talking about, about some of um, that, but um, you're absolutely right. Companies that are scaling and they're growing faster and, and in some cases growing faster than, than anticipated. I think having the foundation you know, is, is understanding what, what is their risk tolerance and how are their, their philosophy about managing risk and how broadly is that cascaded throughout the organization so that, um, you know, uh, everyone's aligned when they're making decisions. I mean, you don't want to discourage innovation. You don't want to discourage, you know, 
thought and idea. She want to encourage it. And so how do you foster that in an environment, um, but also put some discipline around it? And having the foundation there, understanding, okay, what's the risk appetite? What's, what's the tolerance? What are the, the um, I would say, the deal, deal breakers? And, um, and, you know, cascading that information. And then understanding what's at risk, you know, what's the value at, at risk? What are the potential um, mitigation strategies? And insurance is one of, you know, is a mitigation strategies. And there are risks associated with insurance, you know, um, selecting partners and um, policy language and, more importantly, exclusion. And I'm sure Mary will go into a lot more, more de details. But insurance is, is a mitigation strategy that, in many cases, is required because, in, in some instances, insurance is required whether by law or by contract. And then there are other mitigating str strategies. You know, we talked about fires. Um, you know, there's a lot of loss prevention engineering. There was a big earthquake yesterday, you know, so seismic reduction. And, and when you think about mitigation, it's like, what's the best um, technique and most, you know, and we'll, we'll get into cost too, because um, you don't always want the the low dollar cost. Sometimes you have to make those investments to protect your big bets. And so it's, you know, it's constantly evaluating the pros and cons of that. And so um, I, I would say the watch out is you want to be careful not to go for cheap because cheap is just that. You get a lot of paper and a lot of exclusions. And then when the loss comes, you to find out that you know you really don't have the coverage that you have. How many of you have are aware of the insurance programs, and more importantly, the exclusions tied to all of the policies? So, if you're not, one of the first things I would ask um, at at a board, how are we covered? What are the gaps? What are we uninsured for? And I say uninsured because you may think, okay, we have this self-insured program and we have this insurance program, but what about all the things you're unaware? That's where you're uninsured. And so um, I think having an overall strategy mm -hmm. and you're constantly evaluating costs because there may be some um, areas where, um, you know, and I'll, as an example, property insurance and seismic, you may want to say, oh, we may want to invest in some structural things in addition to buying insurance. Um, but I think the short answer is just, again, understanding what's the tolerance, what's at risk, what's the value at risk, what are you trying to protect, and what investments are needed to reduce the risk to, um, you know, a, a comfortable, um, a reasonable le or an acceptable level. Awesome. I think that's a great segue for Mary to actually comment a little bit on uh, how boards view insurance and, and not only insurance and insurable risk, but also non-insurable risk. Um, can you maybe share what board members need to know about insurable versus non-insurable risk? Sure. Um, and first of all, thanks, Joe, and thanks to all of you for being here today and to NACD for having us. Um, the flippant answer is that everything is insurable. For a price. <laughs> I remember as a very young lawyer in the 80s looking, I was learning how to read insurance policies and looking at an architect's professional liability policy and realizing after I looked at it, looked at it, it was a $500,000 limit. There was a $300,000 deductible and a $200,000 premium. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but the architect needed that, as Saray said earlier, to fulfill a contract. Mm -hmm. So they had insurance. There was no real risk transfer. Now, obviously, for a company, you could identify a lot of risks and say, oh, we want to insure all of those, and you're just going to be tying up capital that you probably will never use because you're, you're turning yourself into a mega self-insurance conglomerate and that you might want to use for some other things like running the company. So I think there's always the, the tricky question of really identifying what are the risks that you want to insure and need to insure. And part of that is, frankly, what's available in the market. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain reasons why some risks are not insurable or expensive. Uh, for example, 
emerging areas. You know, a while back it was hard to get cyber. Now, as com as insurance companies understand it more, it's easier to buy it. There's a lot of competition. You can get good coverage. But right now, the cryptocurrency area, I see policies that have exclusions for crypto cryptocurrency risks. There are some insurance companies that are dipping their toe into the water and starting to insure those, but again, very limited basis because the insurance companies are there to make money. And if they can't figure out how to make money, they're not going to underwrite it. So can you, it sounds like there's, you know, a lot of movement in terms of the insurance products in the market. And sometimes the product doesn't necessarily fit the profile of the company. And so there's this need to manuscript policy language. Can you comment on considerations for manuscripting policy language to fit uh, a client's needs and what sort of uh, things the board might want to know about if their executives are moving down that route? Sure. Um, you know, it, again, to be flip, I won't be flipped during the whole conversation, but, you know, I could, I think Soraya and Joe and I could sit together and manuscript a policy that you all would want to have. It would cover everything and there would be no exclusions and you could not find an insurance company to underwrite it. So my view is you really have to set expectations and understand what it is that's important to you and what's realistic in the market. I think there are situations if you have, for example, a complicated ownership or management structure, you have different obligations that you want to make sure are insured, you want to make sure that that language is tailored to fit your needs. I think to, to the extent you can for business interruption because that area is getting so complicated. Uh, whether you're you know, looking for broader forms or manuscripting to meet your own unique supply chain issues or contingent risk issues, it's very important to think about manuscripting that coverage. Um, and, and maybe if you have a newer business product and you're, you're working with the insurance company, they're comfortable insuring some of it but not all of it. You may have to sit down and manuscript out what everybody is comfortable with insuring. The risk of manuscripting a policy, though, is that in, in the general in world of insurance law, if the insurance company sells you a policy and the language was, is ambiguous and you get a claim and the insurance company says, well, we never meant to cover that claim, either your risk manager or your broker or your lawyer can say to the insurance company, that policy language is ambiguous. You created that ambiguity. You insurance company may not have known that you're covering that claim, but you are. And I think 50 states in the United States will agree with you on that point. If, however, you as the policyholder or your agent, such as your lawyer or your broker, starts writing that language, and negotiating it with the insurance company, then if there is an ambiguity, all of a sudden you've lost that protection that the ambiguity gets stuck with the insurance company. It's, it's your problem now. There are times too where I've talked to clients and the, the language isn't quite what we think it should be, but I'll say, well, wait a minute. If we go in and ask for clarification and the insurance company says, no, we didn't mean to cover that, then we have a record of a negotiation which can be used against us in a dispute. So I think you need to be realistic of what you can accomplish and make sure that you are crafting the language in a way where you're not intent unintentionally open yourself up to even greater risk. That's really great commentary. Um, so before you even get to the manuscripting process mm -hmm. of any particular insurance policy, there's usually some sort of review or analysis process mm -hmm. that a company and, and their advisors will go through. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about what executive teams and boards should consider in, in that analysis and review process in terms of best practices? Sure, and I think it probably will depend on different lines of coverage. And I think many companies stagger, a large company will stagger. They don't do their property renewal DNO workers' comp, um, and professional liability all at once. They may stagger them through the year, and it may depend on how complicated each of those programs are. So part of figuring out your resources is where are the policies that, for your particular risk, you could pretty much use off the shelf, mm -hmm. and you don't want to put a lot of resource or political capital with the insurance company into haggling. And where are the policies where you think 
summary view is important. What I've found very useful is when I've worked with brokers and companies where they, they keep a spreadsheet every year of things that they would like to see changed in the policy, whether it's been a change with the company, they've acquired certain risks and they want to think about does the current coverage handle that, or a change in the market. All of a sudden you'll see certain insurance companies are offering more favorable terms. Maybe the insurance company you're working with isn't there yet, but you want to at least get them moving in that direction. So you keep a spreadsheet and every year kind of track, what have you asked for before? What have you ch achieved? What is the insurance company just refusing to cover? And then work, you know, and, and partly too, again, we go back to expectations because in this right now, the market is tougher in a lot of lines than it was before. And so you can't go in and really negotiate the kind of language that you might like, but you have to at least consider what are the most important topics? Is there an exclusion that you really want to narrow? Is there some kind of a, a notice term that you think you need to fix? And I think really prioritize those, work with your broker and see, you know, with the relationships that the broker has with the insurance company, what you can fix and what you can't. At a certain point, you may be able to fix enough that you're happy with. Um, maybe at a certain point, you need to start looking at other carriers. I never recommend that lightly, but I think it's a process that, um, goes on over a couple of years and really is historical. You just don't look at everything clean every year. That's great, thank you. So once you've done your analysis, once you've figured out what you have and all the coverage is in place, um, eventually there's a claim that happens. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit about your experience in managing the claim submittal process and what are some things that boards and executives should know about that process? Sure. Um, I think that whenever a board learns about a certain thing that has happened at the company, some kind of event, a data breach, you know, a, some kind of a loss, some kind of defalcation, the first question out of your mouth should be, have you notified your insurance company? Um, because notice can be very important in, under certain policies, and if you don't notice on time, you could lose some or all of your coverage. So I think that that's really the first issue. I think then you want to talk off, you know, work with the broker and the risk manager. What are the lines of coverage do you want to notice? I recommend being over-inclusive rather than under-inclusive. You may want to talk about messaging. You know, there may be a certain risk and you think, well, it's probably not covered under this certain policy, but just in case, I want to notice it. And obviously, every time you're noticing a big claim, the risk manager is thinking, rightly so, oh, my premiums, my premiums, you know, so how are you walking that line between making sure that you're protected and not having the insurance company think, you know, you've got, we've got a bad risk here. So talk about messaging. Um, if it's a pretty straightforward claim and you think it's gonna be covered, I think it just gets sent out. If you have a claim where you're not quite sure if it's going to be covered or not, I would strategize with the broker and maybe with outside counsel about, do you do a more descriptive notice so that the insurance company understands why you're submitting this claim and why you think it's covered? You don't do that in every case, but it's something you certainly think about. And what about confidentiality issues? Yeah. What are the things that uh, companies and executives and boards might want to be concerned about regarding confidentiality issues. And in, in fact, I think that's one of the reasons why people are concerned about noticing claims. At times they think it's this terrible thing. We don't want anybody to know. You don't want it in the press. We don't want to let our broker know. You know we don't want to let our insurance company know. You know, these, and again, I am in many situations where I am adverse to insurance companies. So they're, I'm not always saying wonderful things about them but it is their business to help you keep things under control. If you send it to your, insur your broker or your insurance company, it's not gonna show up in the Wall Street Journal. Often, if you're a larger company, you may already have non-disclosure agreements in place with your partners. They will be respecting mm -hmm. those. If it's a particularly sensitive situation, I have seen companies very quickly negotiate with their insurance companies specific non-disclosure agreements. 
and provide them under that notice. So I would, um, I would really make sure that you are not letting fear of um, leaks get in the way of notice. Once you've gotten through that process, though, there are things that get a little more complicated. The insurance company might ask you for information that you realize they're not really trying to help you figure out the risk. They're trying to figure out whether they can uh, raise a coverage defense. <laughs> and at that point, you want to think about, are you obligated to provide that information? And you know, do you really, how do you diplomatically say no? There are also issues about attorney-client privilege under certain situations, depending on the type of policy you have. You may send it to privilege information to the insurance company and it's still protected under what's called a duty to defend policy. But under other policies, the insurance company may ask for privilege information, but it, it may not, it may be that once you send it to the insurance company, it loses its privilege. Mm -hmm. So you have to think very carefully about that risk, oh, yeah, balancing, know. making sure the insurance company feels like you are listening to them and giving them what they need, but still protecting your own privilege. And then judges, the last thing I've seen recently is companies struggling with, um, you get a some kind of a governmental notice or inquiry offered from the SEC. And under your policy, because Soraya and Joe have um, helped you negotiate really broad claim language. It's a covered claim, but it will say on the face of this notice, this is confidential. You can't show it to anybody except your lawyers. And there are a number of government agencies which will do that. And so you're in a bind because you have to notice your insurance company to get paid for it, and the government says you can't. And so then I am arming defense counsel with the arguments they need to go to the, um, the government agency and then working with the insurance company to make sure that the insurance company is within the umbrella of that confidentiality notice and we're allowed to access the policy benefits. That's awesome. So those are really great uh, examples of post-claim <coughs> considerations. Can you comment a little bit more on expectation on liability and damages mm -hmm. post-claim and, and what that uh, management process looks like? Sure, thanks. I, the first thing I think people do, need to do is really look at their reservation of rights, understand it. Is there information in there that the insurance company has asked for? And if you can provide it, give it to them right away. Make sure the insurance company feels like you are allowing them to partner with you and that you're not just keeping them arm's length and saying, ah, we have this claim, we're going to deal with it, and then we're going to call you up the day before a settlement conference and say, give us $3 million can't work that way. You have to really work with them and make them feel like they are applying their expertise to the claim as well. Um, but I also think that one of the biggest problems I have seen is not really so much coverage issues, but again, going back to managing expectations. The client will get sued. They hire defense counsel who is gung-ho, comes in, evaluates the case and says, oh, we're going to defense this case, you know, we're going to knock it out on summary judgment, and the other side's a bunch of fraudsters, um, and the insurance company hears that and goes, great, we don't have to worry about this claim, and they reserve it for defense costs. Discovery goes on, things start to go south, because the insurance company was told, ah, oh, this case is going great, they don't really go out and ping, and because they're busy, they've got a lot of claims. Say, how's it going, how's it going? All of a sudden, they get a panic call on <coughs> some bad discovery. Um, or, you know, we did a focus group, and the jury did not buy our case at all. Um, so I think that then to call up the insurance company who has mentally closed that file and say, we need you at a mediation tomorrow with $25 million in authority, it's not going to be pretty. So I think making sure that your defense counsel knows how to manage the insurance company's expectations. You don't want to sound like, you know, the sky's falling, but to be realistic, because the insurance companies are going to remember the good news you gave and not the risks that you've warned about. That's great. And it speaks to the the counsel selection at the time of a claim, which mm -hmm. I think is a very relevant issue. Can you comment a little bit about the expectations on counsel selection that companies yeah. should have? I mean, I realized as I was thinking about this is we've hit a point in our presentation where 
you roll as a board member and the corporate risk issues may not exactly line up with your own rights as a director. And so this is a balance that I think people need to think about. Um, under your indemnity agreement with a company, you may have a right, if you're sued personally, to um, any counsel, as long as they're reasonable. Um, in a situation, you're entitled to have your own counsel and defend the case, and the company pays for it. However, the company may have bought a policy in which the insurance company has the right to appoint counsel. It doesn't have to accept your choice of counsel. Or the insurance company may say, here's a list. You have to pick from somebody on this list. <coughs> you, the, the, uh, the company has to pick from somebody on the list. So you may have situations where your rights as a board member conflicts with the company's obviously desire to get as much of this paid for by insurance. So I think it's important for the company to understand what are their obligations under the indemnity agreement and are those obligations that can be insured or is the company going to have to accept some portion of an insurable risk? That's great. Um, so in that process, what might come out is maybe getting a different policy and potentially even getting additional limits on the policy. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a little bit about warranties on higher limits and, and some of the considerations mm -hmm. for that? Well, I think the first consideration is to make sure that you buy the warranties before you need the coverage. <laughs> <laughs> because you will, you will get insurance and if you're adding layers of coverage, it is very common. In fact, it would probably be remiss on the insurance company's part not to ask, do you have any claims that you're concerned about? And you have to look at that language very carefully and ask, you maybe consult with your broker, maybe consult with your lawyer, here's a situation, is this something I have to disclose? Uh, and if it is, it's probably not worth buying the higher coverage. Or you'll be able to get the coverage, but they will be excluding whatever it is you're worried about. But the warranty language can vary drastically depending on the carrier and particularly in a situation where you don't know of any claims but you don't want to get caught short if something service surfaces and the insurance company later says well wait a minute didn't you know about this uh, you want to make sure that the warranties are limited to the person signing it it's to the best of their knowledge they're not guaranteeing you don't want a warranty that's guaranteeing you don't have any claims. Mm -hmm. You want a warranty that says, as far as I know, we don't have anything. And I'll, you know, there's a range between there. But the particular language is going to be very important. Yeah, that's a really great comment. So in addition to the, the variability of language in the policies, which obviously follows the variability in insurance partners mm -hmm. that you could be <coughs> insured with, can you comment on some of the other considerations in selecting the right insurance partner? Um, I can. I am. I will, I will say I'm probably not the best person to say who the best insurance companies are, because I get the ugly ones. You know, I get the ones where things <laughs> have gone south and there's been a problem. But I think in terms of working with your broker, the question should be things like what is this insurance company's track record in claims? You know, do they have a reputation for being customer friendly? Are they interested in expanding their share of this market so that they're going to try harder and offer um, state-of-the-art coverage and work with you on claims handling? Or are they in a situation where they're not really that interested in the market anymore? So I think those are questions that you should ask. I will say price should be at the bottom of your list. I know that's hard for people who are on the finance committee or the CFOs. But this is a situation where just because somebody is way cheaper doesn't mean that they are the partner that you want to be working with. I'd like to add something mm -hmm. else. Um, you also want a partner that's financially strong. That's true. Because the last thing you want is a, a, an insurance policy and when you have a loss and, and then they, they just can't pay or they're gonna, you know, fight. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, from a counterparty risk management standpoint, it's financial strength, is their reputation, the commitment to the product or that you're, uh, the line of coverage that you, you need. And um, again, claims um, mm -hmm. reputation. 
I think also something on my side in the insurance market, uh, which is the perf- the financial performance that that particular insurance carrier has for that particular line of coverage, can impact how they posture on situations. You know whether they're profitable or unprofitable. How long have they been unprofitable in this line? Those are dynamics in the market that, unless you know where they're coming from, it might change how they make uh, accommodations for you as an as an insured. Um, so those are something, some things to consider as well. And again, you really have to be realistic. Um, unfortunately, now, if you own, you know, like a very expensive commercial property or a hospitality property in um, a fire zone, a wildfire zone, you may not have a lot of choices. Of if you are, you know, a company that is new or has is in a difficult space in the liability world you have to realize there's only so much of this that you can control. So I'm speaking up for the the brokers and the risk managers. They can't get you a perfect product. You just have to realize you've done your best and then assessing, you know, what what your risks are after you have been able to to buy the best insurance you can find. Yeah, that's a good point. So we kind of started off the presentation with uh, raising questions uh, about the insurable risk and non-insurable risk. Um, we're nearing towards the end here. I'm going to give both of you an opportunity to comment on what board members should be asking about their insurance program. Obviously, they're not in the weeds, you know, running the company, but there should be some key things that they should be looking for in and around the insurance program. Um, so I guess I'll let you go first, Mary, and then Soraya, if you want to comment as well. So Soraya and I agreed in advance that we split this into two hats. So I, I'm going to be commenting on the hat that you would be wearing as a director to make sure that your own uh, insurance, particularly your directors and officers liability insurance, is protecting you. And then Soraya will talk about your duty as a board to think about how the corporation's protected. So for your own risk, and this is probably crosses with the corporations too and all lines of coverage, you want to make sure that your broker has properly benchmarked what kind of limits you should have given the type of company that you are and also benchmark to include defense costs because I was involved in a case where the company had a million dollars, hundred million dollars of DNO coverage and spent 95 of that on defense costs. Unfortunately, didn't have a claim, (laughs) didn't have a judgment against them because otherwise there would have been nothing left. So defense costs can be a lot more expensive than people realize. You also want to make sure that the company has the right balance of DNO coverage for site A, non-indemnifiable loss, and then the site B, you know, the indemnifiable loss. For directors, the market for the coverage for your non-indemnifiable loss is still very good, and you can get a lot of carve-outs so that independent directors are not subject to fraud exclusions. They aren't subject to a lot of other exclusions that you will find on your basic uh, DNO policy. Uh, so, and then the other thing, and particularly in a situation where um, there may be concerns about solvency risks, although of course the bigger the concern, the harder it's going to be to get the coverage. But there are many products now. You'll see a company have layers of. They will have what they call their ABC coverage, which is the coverage for all their liability claims. Then they'll have a side A, non-indemnifiable coverage that covers their officers and directors. But then on top of that, they will have a separate layer of coverage for their independent directors. It's called IDL coverage. And that is money that is only for the independent directors and applies if the company is bankrupt um, the company's estate can't claw that back in as an asset of the estate. Mm-hmm. It would apply if there's a derivative case where you have to settle and that's something that the company can't pay for. So that IDL is really the last line of defense for the independent directors. Um, a pure site A policy is nice, but you're also insuring the officers who sometimes are the people who, if something goes bad in the company, they're being sued and they're spending a lot of that money on their attorney's fees. You know, I'm not saying a very small company should have IDL coverage, but it's certainly something to be considered depending on the size of of your company and the risks. 
and I'll kick it over for the well, corporate and side. And in addition, uh, just a you know, as a board member, just I'd like to call out that you're sharing limits, right? So you know, if your policy is X millions of dollars, uh, you know, you're sharing it. They're not just all of those are your your limits. Um, <clears throat> so the thing that I would ask, um, as a you know, if I were in your your shoes, um, is on an annual <coughs> basis, ask about the insurance renewal. You know, what are we covering? How much insurance are we we're buying? What what was the rationale for the limits? Is it enough? And um, and I mentioned earlier, insurance is one mitigation strategies. But what are all the other strategies that are in place to manage um, risk? And how do we? How does the company feel about it? Is you know, is it at a, the residual risk at an acceptable level? And if the answer is yes, great. And if the answer is no, then what are we doing about that? And so um, get your baseline. Start you know, hey, that's like an annual review update on on insurance. Um, and that's separate from what I'll call enterprise risk management, where you want an annual review of what are the key company risks, the top 10 risks. What are we doing to manage those risks? And, um, and then some, if there's a risk manager there or auditor, someone's monitoring, you know, um, what's being done, you know, and is it, are the risks mitigated? So um, get into a process where you have, start with that baseline and then have annual, request annual updates. Um, and I would think that would, would be helpful, giving you some insights. Um, I would say it's important to partner with the broker, brokers get, and, um, and attorneys because they have a lot more information. They manage a lot of uh, clients and um, it's a, a great resource of information, especially benchmark information. And it's, um, important that whoever is uh, working or, or have responsibilities for working with the broker to educate the broker, share information, because that's your partner. You need uh, your broker to understand the business in order to help develop the, the best solutions um, for an organization. Awesome, thank you. I did wanna add one more additional commentary to what you were talking about, Mary, in regards to benchmarking. And I think it's relevant in the current market environment where a lot of brokers, including our firm, will come out with, you know, let's say 10, 20 years of benchmarked information across, you know, various different industries and they'll pick out your profile of company. Um, that information is great and the data is super useful, but what happens when the legal environment changes for that particular risk and it happens today uh -huh. and the future risk is completely different in terms of what your legal expenses might be okay. the dialogue is a little bit more challenging and so i think it's also very important to understand that there's additional subjective commentary that you might want to solicit beyond just the legacy benchmarking because it's all historical looking information. And a lot of the risks that boards are dealing with today around DNO, around cyber, are all forward looking risks that aren't really following the rules of yesterday. Um, and so I would say that's an additional consideration to have in the dialogue in terms of what you're looking at that in, for the insurance program. I think that's a great point. I see it also on the claim side, particularly in the DNO world, because the um, there will be a lot of securities claim and the defense counsel will come in and go in according to, you know, Cornerstone or any of the other big analytics companies. This case is only worth $10 million. You have $100 million in coverage. And the plaintiff is saying, I don't care about Cornerstone. I'm going to take this case to trial unless I get X. And you, as the insured, are stuck between the plaintiffs trying to drive um, the settlements up so then the benchmarks go up and the defendants trying to keep them down and so I think it is important to not only be looking at the statistics but what's happening in the real world and how quickly things are changing you know one Supreme Court decision could really yeah. change your risk with that I'll leave uh, the floor open to questions Yes. Doctor. How, as a board member, do you satisfy yourself that what the company is presenting or proposing as coverage is enough coverage? Well, and I've experienced where companies will retain a coverage council to, you know, take a look, uh, review the policy to see if it, you know, what's covered, what's not, what are some opportunities, um, some gaps. 
So that's one. Um, but I would say the d dialogue with your risk manager, you know, understanding the rationale behind the program and how the decision, you know, were made and what the considerations. Um, but having that deep um, conversation or presentation on, on what's covered and why, what the gaps are and what's being done to manage it. And, and some of it's going to be philosophical, you know, at the, at the enterprise level, how much uh, risk an organization is willing to take. You know, I can also is, add to that a little bit because we do insurance reviews all the time for our clients uh, and prospective clients as well. And one of the things that comes up regularly is the brokerage standard for review really is based on our knowledge of the insurance market and the insurance products. And that to some degree is a limited viewpoint, right? Because there may be language in a particular policy that will respond based on X case law. And that's where somebody like Mary comes in and fills in that additional commentary. And so if you're working with a broker that kind of recognizes you're dealing with a situation where you may want additional <coughs> commentary than just what the insurance company says or what the insurance policy says or what you've seen with your other clients, you need further commentary on what's happening in the legal environment or that particular demographic or that region. It's important to know that there's more than just the insurance brokerage review that might come into play, especially if it's an important risk for your company. Yes, Amy. I have a question, uh, just to double click on the ERM framework. I know you said, you know, don't use, don't rely on COSO, develop your own framework. I found with a company that I'm on the board of, it's uh, when we go through the process of talking about ERM and risks, it feels, um, too qualitative for me and and there's the uncontrollable risks like geopolitical risks mm -hmm. and then there's the controllable risks that are more execution oriented but but you know maybe because long ago I worked at McKinsey like it feels like a good framework and more analysis is appropriate given the topic yeah, and I, I think you're right. You know, there are frameworks out there, and there's lots of good information, and it gives you a good base. Um, but what I suggest is is customize. You know, use the, the the frameworks and take what's applicable to your organization, <coughs> how decisions are made, and how you manage, um, and apply. But create something that specific you know, and unique and customized for the organization. Um, I've, I've heard of examples where um, entities would hire um, a, a firm to a stat, help them build an ERM program, and that's what they're doing. They're bringing an off-the-shelf, hey, here it is, and, and it's almost cookie-cutter where they're changing the name and, 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 and changing the logo. Well, you know, that only go, gets you so far, you know, Enterprise risk management, I mean, it really is. It's something that's really personal. How you manage risk is, is personal. And it's going to, and every organization has their own level of, of, you know, risk tolerance and philosophy about what they're willing and uh, will accept. And so I would take the framework, take the technical aspects of, you know, these frameworks and then apply it where it makes sense. Integrate risk management in to exist in business processes where it makes sense. Um, develop um, the structure according to how your organizations are structured. So, um, and that's what I would suggest. And I would challenge um, any consultant or uh, firm to say, okay, you know, here are some frameworks based on what you know about organiza our organization, how would you recommend that we create something that's just custom made where it fits like a glove for us? We've got about two minutes left. I wanted to add to that too, in, in terms of a general trend in the insurance business that may help with this sort of or quantitative analysis from what are seemingly qualitative subjects like policy language. There's quite a few companies coming into the business that are taking AI and reading policies yeah. Uh, they're mapping the, you know, strength in, in terms of a percentile, the strength of that particular clause, you know, across 50 different insurance carriers like that. Um, and the industry is slowly moving towards bringing quantitative metrics to what 
would generally take a very long time to do. And so we're moving forward. It's, it's happening. It's just not happening that fast. And so I think in the future, you'll, you'll see a substantially higher level of quantitative data on what today is sort of a qualitative analysis of what's happening on the insurance program. And even in the manuscripting example, you can manuscript language, but how often, you know, let's say you have a three-year contract and you get your new policy for the new year, somebody's going in to look to see those exact three words were changed unless you had a robot that pulled it out and caught it immediately. And you, you have, you know, let's say 30, 40 different insurance policies for the entire company. It's hard to do consistently. And so we're seeing technology come in and fill those gaps and give better insight, better confidence level to executive teams and to boards so that they can feel comfortable that all this effort and time that they put into this process is actually staying, you know, on a going forward basis. So that's a, a really cool trend that we're seeing and I think it will continue. So, um, yes, one last question. We're about two minutes over, but. I was wondering if you could comment about uh, DNO coverage for Section 16 liability, particularly in the case of an IPO or a secondary offering. It should be insurable. Insurable? I think, yes. I think that, again, you would have to be careful about any warranties. But there, for a while, there were some bad trends in the case law where courts were saying an IPO, a claim, it's basically like a rescission claim, and we're not going to cover it. And there was a huge outcry because people were buying DNO coverage for securities risks, which include IPOs. So the market is much better on that right now. I will say, however, although you can get the legal language, I am hearing from brokers that because of just what's going on in the world and all the IPOs that haven't met expectations, shall we say, <laughs> that and then if you don't meet expectations, you get a lawsuit, that they're getting a lot more expensive, the, the, that people are getting major sticker shock, and also that you should be building in limits under your private management liability even before you get to the IPO market so that you're avoiding, um, you're just not jumping from $4 million to $100 million, and you're not having to build in higher limits warranties right when you're going to market. Great. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have. Um, I don't know if you want to wrap up, Dennis. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Mary. <coughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Savannah. And, um, Do you want to click forward, Dennis? Oh, there's a couple more slides. Oh, yeah, I would like to encourage all of you to um, join us on some, some of our future programs. Um, we'll be having a program on Thursday at PwC uh, on cybersecurity, and be following that up with a program on M and A, um, and after that, um, corporate tax update on November the 5th. Um, I believe the one on the 15th uh, for the California Economic Outlook at this particular time has been canceled. So thank you very much for being with us today, and please join us in the future. <laughs>